Emergency Medical Minute presents Mental Health Monthly. Substance-induced psychosis, the agitated geriatric patient, manic episodes, paramedics, nurses, mid-level providers, and physicians in the ED all regularly have to manage patients with psychiatric conditions, often with limited training and resources. In this series, psychiatric experts keep it real, raw, and relevant about what you need to know to successfully care for these patients in an emergency setting. My name is Randy Libin. I'm an assistant professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Neurology at the University of Colorado. I completed my medical school training at the University of Arizona and my psychiatry residency training at the University of Colorado. I've been working with patients with non-epileptic seizures for the past five years. This is a disease process that is heavily impacted by a history of trauma and why I'm a huge advocate and proponent of trauma-informed care which will be the topic of today's episode. Patients with non-epileptic seizures often present repeatedly to the emergency department and are mistreated and misunderstood, which ultimately fuels and worsens their condition and can trigger a trauma response. To give you an idea of the impact and treatment these patients are getting in medical settings, I'm going to share a few quotes we have heard from patients in our treatment program for non-epileptic seizures, specifically given to our neurologist first one. They rubbed my sternum raw and stuck things under my fingernails. Second one. They left me alone and told my husband I was faking it and so he should ignore me too. Third quote. I woke up with my feet bleeding from the doctors sticking pins in them to wake me up. In medicine, we take the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. As you can see from these quotes, harm is coming to these patients. Trauma-informed care is a topic that all medical professionals can benefit from learning about, and especially emergency department providers who can be first line to a patient's introduction to the medical system. By no means does anyone treat patients poorly on purpose. Emergency departments are busy and stressful environments, and trauma-informed care can seem like something that isn't urgent or pressing. We can think about trauma-informed care as an attitude that takes practice to develop. I hope to give you some ideas for starting to implement a more trauma-informed attitude or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. This experience has lasting adverse effects on the individual's health, functioning, and well-being. Trauma can range from emotional, physical, and sexual experiences to having life-threatening medical illness or fear for one's life. Trauma, especially as measured by the Adverse Childhood Events Questionnaire, which is called ACE for short, can also include childhood neglect, having a family member with a mental health or substance use disorder, witnessing violence, and poverty. Another important aspect of trauma-informed care is understanding how common it is. In the general population, 25% of children experience some sort of maltreatment. 25% of women have experienced domestic violence, and 20% of women have experienced rape. These numbers become even higher when we look at patient populations in mental health or substance use treatment. The next aspect of trauma-informed care includes understanding the full impact that trauma has on a person and their health care needs. There's well-documented evidence, mainly stemming from studies done out of Kaiser regarding adverse childhood events, that a history of trauma, particularly during childhood, increases risk of many health problems, including chronic lung, heart, and liver disease, and negatively impacts morbidity and mortality. Trauma experiences also increase the risk of depression, sexually transmitted infections, and substance use. Medical settings can be traumatizing for patients for many reasons, particularly invasive procedures, the necessity of removing clothing, and physical touch, the inherent power dynamics of medical relationships, the gender or appearance of healthcare providers, and lack of privacy can also be triggering situations, which is especially concerning in busy emergency departments. Next section, how to identify it. There are five main components to trauma-informed care, which include creating a safe environment training all clinical and non-clinical staff on principles of trauma-informed care, preventing secondary traumatization in staff, being transparent about system changes in becoming trauma-informed, and including patients in the planning process of becoming trauma-informed. 
Trauma-informed care can be implemented in healthcare settings with the goal of more effectively engaging patients in care to improve outcomes for patients first and foremost. This can include better and more open communication about what will be happening to them while in your care and asking them about their preferences when possible and when they are coherent. A secondary benefit of trauma-informed care is helping to reduce costs for social services and health care. This means reducing frequent visits to the emergency department or long waiting periods for care or disposition in the emergency department. Learning to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in patients, family members, and employees is another important step. This includes recognizing secondary traumatization that occurs in staff and providers treating patients who have experienced trauma. Screening tools for adverse childhood events can be found at one of the resources provided, aceaware.org. Why should you care as an emergency department provider about trauma and trauma-informed care? The care that you provide for traumatized patients and how we treat our colleagues is impacted by knowledge about the effects of trauma on health and well-being. Providing trauma-informed care can reduce agitation in patients and aggressive behavior towards staff, which can make staff and providers feel safer. Next section, best practices in an emergency setting. The best way to think about having a trauma-informed approach is to think of what has happened to your patient and subsequently how that has affected their emotional and physical well-being instead of thinking about what is wrong with the patient. Patients with a history of trauma require more sensitivity to their needs and vulnerability. Once you understand the impacts of trauma, it is important to look for ways to help patients with prevention and treatment from the negative effects of trauma. Even if changes can't happen at an organizational level, trauma-informed care can start by individual practitioners learning and implementing their own trauma-informed practices as it will still have a positive impact on the patients you see. Here are three ways to try practicing trauma-informed care. Number one, patient empowerment, choice, and collaboration. This means educating patients and allowing patients to make choices about their care when possible. Collaboration can help to level the power differential between patients and providers. Number two, create an environment of safety and sensitivity. This means making healthcare settings and activities that take into account patients' physical and emotional safety. This also includes considering that patients have diverse backgrounds of gender, sexuality, race, culture, and ethnicity, and being sensitive to differences in their needs as a result. Number three, trustworthiness and transparency. This involves making clear expectations with patients about what treatments are being suggested, who will provide these services, and how this care will be provided. By putting some careful thought into how you talk to patients about trauma and thinking about how trauma impacts the care they receive and their health, we can all improve the care we provide for patients who have experienced a history of trauma. By implementing these concepts and ideas, we can provide better care for our patients and better support one another as colleagues. The Emergency Medical Minute would like to thank our sponsor, Swedish Medical Center, for helping fund our nonprofit organization and make this podcast possible. Donations are essential to our organization to cover operational costs and fund the creation of our online courses offering AMA PRA Category 1 credits. So if you enjoy our show, and if you're able to make a one-time or recurring donation towards our organization, any amount is helpful. Please click the link in our show notes to make a donation Thank you for listening.